primarily I work as an academic, I work as a scholar, I work with questions of film and media histories. Um, and uh, that has really been my primary area uh, of both teaching as well as research. Uh, some of which you will see today, hopefully, in form of the, this presentation. Um, I am not going to be talking about 90s romance and music and uh, and uh, Bollywood because uh, that is my that is my uh, PhD which I'm in the course of finishing right now. But uh, you can ask me as much as you want about that. But what I'm extracting from there is really the question of film and media genres and how we can look at it both intertextually as well as intermediately uh, that it makes sense across uh, across disciplines uh, disciplines now so i'm really trying to put a matter into that something about cinema that i'm usually asked so, about by way of intro introduction and moving into uh, my uh, presentation uh, as it is uh, I want to open uh, with a clip from a 2011 uh, film called Hugo. And uh, in this clip, you will see these two young children wander into a library looking and trying to search for uh, something that they have, they have chanced upon. They need more information on that. And that is, uh, that really is uh, cinema chance upon through this wonderment of the children as we chance upon a little bit of early cinema history uh, what we also who we also encounter is the figure of the film historian the film historian looks at these children uh, laughs at them scoffs at them at the fact that they are interested in reading about cinema because he has written the book that they are looking at the children look back at him and tell him he has got some very uh, important information wrong. The films that he, uh, the films and the filmmaker whom he has declared absent and dead is very much alive. Um, and I am just going to uh, right now uh, play that little bit uh, for you. The film academy library. You will find all you need to know about movies there. Second level, fourth row. Section three and uh, yes, top shelf. The invention of dreams by Rony Taba. The story of the first movies. In eighteen ninety five. One of the very first films ever shown was called A Train Arrives in the Station, which had nothing more than a train coming into the station. When the train came speeding toward the screen, the audience screamed because they thought they were in danger of being run over. No one had ever seen anything like it before. No one had ever seen anything like it before. What began as a sideshow novelty soon grew into something more when the first filmmakers discovered they could use the new medium to tell stories. Filmmaker George Manies was one of the first to realize that films had the power to capture dreams. 
the great pioneer of early filmmaking, died during the Great War. Died during the Great War. You're interested in Melies? Uh, yes. It's loud. Is it? He's my godfather, you see. And very much alive. Thank you very much. That's not possible. I assure you, sir, it's true. Why should I believe you? Because... Because it's true. And yes, alive. <laughs> Shh. Come with me. So quite like the historian, film historian in uh, Hugo, René Dabar, I would now request you to come with me as I tell you about a journey of genres across geographies, across histories, as with the journey of film genres, more specifically as aesthetic codes, narrative tropes, historical configurations, uh, repetitions, revisions of genres have taken place historically to probably give us a sense of where we are in terms of uh, visual cultures, in terms of narrative cultures, as we constantly interact with various forms of narrative through multiple medias in which cinema remains today, but only one. But at the turn of the 20th century, cinema really emerged uh, like in the video you see, uh, the train arriving at the station, cinema's coincidence with the turn of 20th century technological modernity across, West, uh, across the West, but also its impact upon the uh, rest of the world, whether they were West colonies imperialized and colonized by uh, Western countries, or even towards the uh, farthest of corners, because film became a media that minutely traveled. And as it traveled, it energized a lot of different kinds of cultural imaginations to come into the fore of, uh, of the visual, of the performative, as well as of the, uh, of the oral. So uh, I'm going to uh, uh, speak a little bit, and I'm also going to simultaneously show you uh, bits and pieces of, uh, of clips from here and there. I am beginning for just uh, the purposes of illustration. I am beginning, of course, with Western Hollywood and Euro, uh, slightly American and Eurocentric uh, genres, because that's where really the uh, industrial, the capitalistic, the repetitive mode of production of film genres begin. But with that, I hope that I will be able to leap into how they also historically energize different uh, concerns and anxieties in uh, in our own context, which is in the Indian popular cinematic uh, uh, cinematic context. Um, uh, in case of any questions, any doubts, or any issues with what you are seeing, please use the message box, and because I'm looking at it on another device, so I will be able to monitor uh, that as well. Uh, all right, so I'm going to present my uh, screen. Okay, uh, so uh, as the as I showed you, as the historian laughs at this chil these children and remarks that it can't be what the historian has written should be uh, should be the uh, final word. 
but it is not because films reappear films disappear media is constantly an energizing object but it also dissipates the fact that cinema as the as hugo tells us that the fact that cinema actually originated from certain scientific experiments it was uh, uh, it got, got caught up in patent wars between scientists and technological uh, innovations but where it also went in and travel to is that it went into the arena of popular entertainment practices and in popular entertainment practices it had to fight for its space with theater but not only classical theater but also popular theatrical practices amusement parks coming up at that time other forms of amusement and entertainment practices in uh, vaudeville shows and circuses etc so cinema really origins its origins are that of origins of attraction so as film scholars have pointed out that cinema doesn't start off as a narrative form it doesn't have the means immediately to become a narrative form but as the happen chance of history would tell us that the most dominant form of cinema that we actually encounter and live with and experience is that of narrative and fictional uh, fictional cinema so we are interested in cinema that actually tells stories and how it tells stories i choose genres and specifically i choose genres because genres are not only ways in which we identify uh, which films we like what we want to expect from films or what we want to see what gives us pleasure enjoyment which makes us think uh different classifications but genres are also productions industry values na national and national and transnational or global anxieties so stories uh that are genres have a historical component they also in their repetitions and their reiterations often unfold things retell things that we are generally interested in cinema of course and film genre actually is something that visually performatively codifies orally organizes performatively describes certain uh, human experiences whether personal collective so genres really become conduits of stories they become conduits also of all these aspects that cinema brings together in its visual oral and stylistic and performative patterns so we begin to as audiences we begin to identify these patterns visually and we begin to form certain kinds of affective and identificatory embodying relationships to these forms um and this is really the repetition of what i have been uh, i've been saying so uh what i am primarily interested in to take you through a little bit of a early history of cinema to suggest that as cinema emerges at this 20th century turn and uh, becomes also a form that begins to for the first time unlike any other in motion in movement uh, begins to record its own emergence the camera can both represent but it can also record and as it begins to re re represent and record it also gradually takes the takes uh, the turn towards uh, towards narrative the narratives of the 20th century early cinema forms are also narratives which really talk about this experience of modernity in these narratives you are const you will constantly see um for instance uh, um, bodies uh, that are uh, that are thrown into the uh, into the rapid diz dizzying experiences of modernity so things crashing or for instance uh, things falling people falling uh, from places these are really the first bodies that we actually begin to see through cinema and see through narrative cinema are mediated through genres of uh, this particular genre of the stunt film which of course has varieties in comic in adventure in also historical 
oracles, but these are bodies which could not speak, but could act, could perform. So they are exaggerated bodies, but they become a template of mediating certain kinds of sense, a certain sensorium that the technological modernity, the urban modernity of cities were pushing human bodies increasingly, uh, increasingly towards. So silent cinema practices that incredibly begin to depend on these various aspects, which film scholars have noted that they did not really speak only through narrative modes, as in they weren't only interested in telling the story, but they were also interested in attractions and spectacles because cinema was a new form. It needed people to see it. It really needed people to interact with it. It was making its own space within the space of modernity that it was gi given. So cinema theaters begin to come about with narrative cinema. But what the silent film does is that the silent film establishes certain narrative conventions. It already establishes these the spectacularness of bodies that is that what you see in these films is a lot of reality lot of the reality of the outside world in terms of automobiles in terms of buildings in terms of um, uh, in terms of the characters but what are who are these characters these characters are constantly running in or running away from something they are constantly in motion they're constantly in speed acceleration this movement to display movement becomes a very important concern for cinema and it displays movement also through these embodied bodies, which in reality, if you throw bodies into this kind of a speed and acceleration, they will exhaust, they will, uh, they will combust, but the cinematic bodies don't combust, they come alive just like the gifs on your screen, they come alive, they repeat their actions, they come back again and again. This is also really the feature of genres. Genres use repetitive codes, they use established conventions because they become pleasurable identifications. They become identifiable narrative codes and that is how genres begin, uh, begin to function. While Hollywood takes on the stunt film, uh, another form of film that really, another category of film across the, around that time during the 90s, 20s and 30s, that that really creates an impact world over is that of German Expressionism. And German Expressionism comes from, of course, it comes from uh, the European context, but um, for the longest time, it was also associated with the fact that Europe was going through a very strong fascist turn of the time. So the cinema that it produced was very high aesthetic. It was very, very, it was also very uh, incredibly studio based and it created these lavish sets. It created abstractions. It created costumes. It wasn't speaking through realist forms. It was speaking through an exaggerated excess of visual uh, information. Uh, this kind of a texture of cinema, the tropes that German Expressionism used has actually continued uh, uh, continued to uh, influence later and more contemporary practices in terms of some of the features that expressionism used. The figure of the mad scientist, the uh, dystopian sci-fi city, the exaggerated makeup, uh, the, you know, the lined eyes, the chiaroscuro lighting, the, uh, these faces. When we look back at history and try to contextualize something like German Expressionism, it doesn't really speak as a fascist form any longer. It actually speaks more as a genre which was expressing something very non-literally, very visually, it has the codes of the trauma, the suppression and the repressions of the time of living in a political society like that embedded in these characters, these visual tropes, the vampires, the rising from the dead, the mad scientists, uh, something uncanny was happening in Europe. That uncanny gets translated. And that uncanny we see in a lot of newer and later genres, some of which is playing on your screen right now, lot of visual references to German expressionism that continue even, uh, even today. 
with that i would like to move on to what happens then when uh when sound appears on uh, on screen as sound appears on screen it makes it pushes for a shift in these genres these spectacular genres these uncanny bodies this kind of uh, this unreal universe of flourishing imagination and acceleration needs to be moderated and brought back into certain tendencies of very similitude as in things need to become a little more naturalistic stories need to become a little more realistic because sound means that you will now have the speaking subject if characters can speak then they can emote they can speak they can embody those emotions and things would begin to happen now on the soundtrack and narrative in cinema becomes a little slightly more enclosed space in the sense that it stops looking out from the screen instead it wants you your gaze is mobilized into what you are seeing into the uh, seeing into the uh, screen so it goes from cinema looking at you and giving you a sense of your experiences it becomes really about bringing the spectator inside the narrative universe so the shots become like that right shot reverse shot nobody is going to look out of the screen everybody is, and you know you are either looking over the shoulder or you are looking at the character or where the character is looking there is a mobilization of gaze that takes place and as it takes place we have what is really known as the classical narrative form which is what all of cinema does uh, 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 does this is how uh, this is the cinema that we know this is the cinema that we uh, you know have come to experience and and uh, and uh, you know imagine um just to give you an example then what happens to then the silent era genres and what are these new then the new narrative cinema the sound cinema what kind of genres does it push cinema uh, cinema towards so first uh, first up i'm going to show you a little bit from a very important uh, film uh, charlie chaplin's modern times a lot of what i have said uh can is illustrated by this which is that uh chaplin belonged to the silent film era the coming of narrative cinema sound cinema meant that the silent cinema actor and the silent cinema body would now be made redundant and extinct chaplin makes this film at the turn of when sound cinema arrives he is the only silent character in this world of modern times the machinic is engulfing the technological is engulfing the human in this and he really this film becomes a culmination of the 20th century experience of how human bodies need to adapt to time need to adapt to speed but how also the silent film and the silent film actor needs to give away now to a new technological innovation which is that of sound interestingly uh the first experiments of sound cinema are actually carried upon on uh the first sound film that is carried upon uh, uh as a as a form 
to represent what sound cinema is going to look like, what cinema is going to look like in the future. This is not of the stunt or the adventure genres, not of the loving tramp being engulfed by, uh, by the whole apparatus of modernity and not through the exaggerated excesses of the silent film, uh, silent film genres, but the representative for that uh, film through which actually Warner Brothers studio, a very important studio and very pioneering in the capitalistic form of genre production in, the, in Hollywood pushes for this technology that they have bought. And they do that through the first Mickey Mouse film. As I play this little bit for you, notice that this is what the narrative cinema is about, that no sound on the soundtrack should go uh, uh should remain uh this if it is if it cannot be reasoned as to where the sound is coming from within the narrative then it becomes a different genre it would probably become horror or mystery or thriller or something like that if it is a drama if it is a melodrama if it is a more uh, if it is some sort of a standard dramatization of narrative cinema then uh, all sounds that are put on the soundtrack, apart from the music, which is extra cinematic, everything else should be diegetic, that is within the narrative. And as you see this, uh, see this uh, little bit from the early uh, first, one of the first Mickey Mouse films, you will see that as this character moves in, in the animation form, every action is given a sound effect because it now becomes not just about seeing cinema but it also also it really also becomes about hearing and feeling the actions that are taking place in the um in this uh, cinematic uh, in the narrative universes of uh, the films As you can see, every action, every movement that is drawn on, uh, on screen, every object, in fact, that begins to move on screen, that needs to be justified and accounted for with sound. Because sound also now begins to form what the new genres are going to look like. So one of, of course, the important genres that come about with sound cinema is that of the musical. But we also have the more more dominant global form of the melodrama, the family melodramas, etc., 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 in which uh, now speech and dialogue becomes a very, very important component, and um, uh, we move uh, we move away from just depicting. Uh, object lives or inanimate lives or excessive inexhaustible bodies to more naturalistic bodies. We move towards subjectivities. We move towards emotional concerns with the coming of sound cinema. And one of the things that the entire phase of the classical Hollywood era, which is basically the dominant narrative form that we encounter mm -hmm. in all forms of uh, filmmaking across the, across the world. One of the things that was said about classical, about about, about uh, these genres was the fact that these melodramas, who were they making these for? Um, at the time in the Hollywood, in America of the 1930s, mid 1930s and then 1940s and 50s, um, as the world wars go by and the re and recession and various kinds of economic and political transitions take place, women begin to take, uh, you know, gain more participation in the workforce and melodrama industrially begins to get classified as the women's film 
uh, industrially as particularly being made for female audiences. A uh, popular term that they used around that time was also the VPs because they are so emotional and everybody uh, kind of uh, kind of cries so much. And these are really emotional uh, universes. Uh, with that, uh, with that kind of an association, there is also a lot of debate that who was really who gets to categorize the genre is it the audiences it is is it the industry or is it the form or the aesthetic tropes that you begin to see i'm going to play a series of uh, clips one from a classical melodrama one from a musical that actually reflects back into the origins of its own birth which is the coming of sound and characterizes the problem of what happens when these kinds of technological changes happen and genre shifts need to be made quickly. Industry is pushing for it. Are we really ready for it? Can we really adapt to new genres and these kinds of concerns? And then I'm going to move to a later film, which takes on this uh, imagination of the 1950s VPs industrially called VPs, academically called the women's film, and creates a job and talks and really talks about a relationship. It really depicts the relationship of what audiences begin to, how audiences begin to form relationship, uh, relationships to these particular kinds mm. of uh, kinds of genres. So first up on your screen is something very, very conventional, which is the classical Hollywood form in which you see the camera follows the gaze of the character and the camera, the shot transitions are always established through somebody's gaze, as in somebody is looking at somebody and talking, or you as the spectator are overlooking one of the characters and talking. So this is an enclosed space that emerges. These are no longer, uh, ex these are no longer spectacular in the sense of unreal but they become spectacular perhaps in the sense of emotions and subjectivities so this is from a 1945 film casablanca and of course you notice that this is really a very tight frame it's a very enclosed frame and the gaze of the character is very very important She's not looking at you any longer like silent film, but you are instead overlooking her shoulder, looking at who she is looking at and talking. So conversations and dialogues come about. Similarly, the context of silent cinema's own origins. This is a musical called Singing in the Rain. It is a musical. It musical happens because of the coming of sound but interestingly genres and i want to emphasize on that genres are never really stable categories genres are also often self-reflexive they look back into their own uh, own codes and categories they look back at their own characters often revise them telling the stories of their own making singing in the rain would be one example like that. A sound film, a musical film, would not have been possible without synchronized sound, but it looks back at what it erases industrially as a genre to become this musical. She's got to talk into the mic. I can't pick it up. Cut! What's the matter, Dexter? Lena, look, Lena. Don't you remember I told you there's a microphone right there in the bush? Yeah. You have to talk into it. I was talking, wasn't I, Miss Dinsmore? Yes, my dear, but please remember round toes. Pierre, you shouldn't have come. Pierre, you shouldn't have come. Yes, yes, my dear, that's much better now. Hold it a second. Now, Lena, look. Here's the mic. Right here in the bush. Yes. Now you talk towards it. 
The sound goes through the cable to the box. A man records it on a big record in wax. But you have to talk into the mic first. In the bush. I'll try it again. She is dumb. Oh, she'll get it, Dexter. Look, Lena, don't worry. We're all a little nervous the first day. Everything's going to be okay. Oh, by the way, Roscoe, you know the scene coming up where I say, Imperious Princess of the Night? I don't like those lines there. Is it all right if I just say what I always do? I, I love you, I love you, I love you. Sure. Anyway, it's comfortable. But into the bush! Okay, again. Quiet! Roll them! What? Dana, we're missing every other word. You've got to talk into the mic. Thunderstorm outside? It's those pearls, Mr. Simpson. I am the noblest lady of the court, second only to the queen. Yet I am the saddest of the mortals in France. Why, what is the matter with you? I'm so downhearted, Teresa. My father has me betrothed to the Baron de Lansfield, and I can't stand him. Oh, <laughs> All the ladies of the court wish they were in your pretty shoes. My heart belongs to another. Pierre Vitali. Ever since I met him, I can't get him out of my mind. Sounds good and loud, huh? So uh, you get the you get the picture. They uh, this is of course a comic way of looking at uh, at the genre's own past, but it really problematizes the various uh, kind of uh, and you know comically through genre codes. It problematizes what it has left behind to become what it has actually uh, become. Uh, yes, Kamani, you need to say something. No, no, you can't. Uh, just yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I, I like just five to ten minutes, and I'll conclude quickly. Yes, sure. Yes, yeah. sure. Okay. All right. Um. Uh, okay, so uh, that really brings me to the context of then what was perhaps happening in the Indian uh, Indian context, and um, uh, the Indian context. Uh, the Indian. One second. Just one second. Sorry, I have a pet who gets very excited suddenly. One second. Okay, so in the Indian context, we begin to notice uh, we begin to notice a lot of influences of these uh, um, American and European genres. But what we also get is that. Uh, we don't. We also get a particular kinds of genres that are very much located in the histories and cultural contexts of the time, which is that this the Indian context also uh, represents the context of both colonial film as well as post-colonial film. Because when cinema travels to uh, the colonies, it is actually a site of a lot of colonial anxiety and censorship because what we are beginning to see on screen is a very democratic and very um, uh, open representation of uh, whiteness, which for quite some time rattles the uh, uh, you know rattles the colonial governments all across but what also rattles is the energies with which the indian or the or the post colonies take to this new uh, form that is cinema so india actually produced in the context in 
from colonial times to a lot of early uh, 30s and 40s, produced a lot of cinema that fell into the genres very broadly classified as historicals, mythologicals, biogra biographicals, but most importantly, the social. Under the social came in a lot of different kinds of uh, representative strategies, genre codes, everything, creating a very hybrid form of melodrama, which was invested in concerns of, uh, of the time and of the place. But it was also borrowing a lot of genric, uh, genric features from others. Most prominently, I will again take you back in the interest of time. I'll again take you back to the uh, to the stunt film. And uh, the reason uh, I'm going to do that and I'm going to conclude with that is that uh, the the lovable tramp, for instance, from Chaplin uh, travels and becomes the uh, becomes the avara in the Raj Kapoor in Raj Kapoor's persona. And as it becomes uh, so, it is also the sound film. It is also a song-based uh, song based form. For, uh, for the longest time, these forms were considered to be, these forms often get fall into the pressures of, uh, of uh, political representation, but also aesthetic pressures of whether or not they actually represent the realities of time in these kinds of fictional and in these kinds of allegorical uh, forms. I would end with two examples. One, of uh, one, of course, of the Avara figure uh, who walks and when he sings and he walks through this uh, wilderness, he's been read as a spokesperson of the new nation. He represents, he's poor, he's the street figure, the imagination of which is coming from a different genre and is resituating in a different uh, narrative genre in a different country, but he has been read as embodying that voice. And as he has been read embodying that voice, he's also been read as his utopian imagination. I would like to open up that space a little bit with imagining this traveling John Rick figure. As he walks through this open wilderness into the new nation, he is also encountering a lot of uh, a lot of people walking or moving in or migrating onto onto that land. And with that image, I would also like to uh, draw your attention to the fact that it may not be telling us something directly and it may be voicing and articulating and singing of a utopia, but it actually visually begins to also capture the condition of post-coloniality, a, a visual referent of the memory of a divided, of nation making that has happened through divisions, through cartographical, uh, cartographical divisions. The other character that from another uh, movie that I would like you to encounter is typically the stunt figure, but the stunt figure in a very, very different, uh, different body. So Raj Kapoor, I won't in the interest of time because most of you have seen it. So I'll, uh, you know, I'll, uh, uh, avoid that for now but what i would instead like like uh, to show you is uh, something from something a little bit uh, more uh, something a little bit older and not so easily available in the public uh, domain <laughs> मुझे जाने दो। हजी अब जाना ही कहाँ है? जलसा तो खत्म हो गया। क्यों? अजी बिल्कुल सच कहा। आओ, जरा दिल बहलाएं। आओ, वो बप्पा है। ये क्या? ये ये ये। एक और हमारी तरफ से भी। अगर मेरा पास चले तो ऐसे नीच कुत्तों को लात मारकर चाय के बाहर ठकेल दूँ। चलो बच्चा की। छोड़ दो मुझे जाते हो। बदमाश पाजी निकल यहाँ से। बंद हो मत। ओह हाँ कहीं का। आह 
ये बात है अभी अभी देखा जाएगा मिया जो कोई सामने आ जाए उसका सीना सी देना आपको मेरे हाथ से बच्चों में ही आ सकते लोगों ने दखल दिया तो उसका नतीजा भी भुगतना पड़ेगा ऑल राइट सो दैट वॉज वॉट हु वी नो एज फियरलेस नादिया एंड नादिया बिकेम वन ऑफ द स्पेक्टैकुलर बॉडीज इन द इंडियन ट्रेडिशन ऑफ अर्ली जॉनरास टू प्रेजेंट द स्टंट फिल्म अ वेरिएशन ऑफ द स्टंट फिल्म एंड एज द स्टंट फिल्म ग्लोबली ट्रेवल्स फ्रॉम हॉलीवुड टू इंडिया इन द कॉन्टेक्स्ट ऑफ अ नेशन इन द थ्रोज ऑफ वेरियस फॉर्म्स ऑफ नेशनल is discourses and debates of the time we all know from history that history uh, that the nationalist movement struggles with the question and women's freedom for the longest time and we see that being replicated in cinema and cinema genrically mediating it through the social differently through the stunt film differently through the melodramas that it goes on through the history oracles and mythologicals uh, differently i wanted to show you this because it really brings us to the complexity that old genres uh, of the old genres into also the new where this complexity this tradition this conventional of the good woman and the bad woman the bad woman identified as with her western markers but the uh, but this woman also racially a mixed race woman so these are these are with the formation of the nation these are stories these are genres which are actually going to get enveloped and in to quite an extent it is in the favor of the social and the melodrama and the emotional context but in this moment in the genres flourishing in the context of colonial india we see nadia become the voice of what the nationalist question is trying to resolve she is by no account can she actually be a madhulika but there is a signifier of a bindi on her head to name her 
Republika. Her name and her body doesn't go together, but nevertheless, she is voicing the nationalist voice uh, in many ways when uh, because she is the educated woman. She is also the woman who has gone to the gymnasium. The city is doing, the city is equipping her with certain kinds of change. The nationalist form actually, the nationalist discourses politically struggle with this. And we have interestingly a genre that actually offers a certain kind of of a, uh, a certain kind of a hope, a certain kind of a solution at that uh, at that time. I'm going to, because in the interest of time, I'm going to end here, but I'm going to end with my uh, concluding, uh, a concluding example, which is that uh, we do see the recurrence of older genres in newer, uh, sorry, I'm looking for my PowerPoint, yes, older genres in newer forms. So for the longest time, the social and the melodrama had dominated Indian uh, screens in a way that we had hybrid genres. We had really mixed conventions and representations, and we couldn't be classified into the generic code. But today with the flourishing of the industry in form of networks and studios and newer and newer viewing platforms, genrefication has really become a mode of organizing viewership, organizing spectatorial interests, and perhaps even organizing industrial interests. But genres, as I showed you, are also reflexive. They embody their own memories of being something earlier and mediating something new. We see the return of the, we are seeing the return of the historical as well as the mythological like no other at this time. And the question perhaps we should be asking, it was what really is this new historical or the new mythological trying to retell? It's borrowing a lot in terms of visual forms and visual traces. It borrows a lot from older, uh, older genres because cinema thinks through its own media. Its characters look like its past looks like the cinematic past more rather than the historical past because no one has really seen the historical past. So these are mediations and genres mediate. And as these genres mediate, what kind of contemporary anxieties do we see in the new historical? What kind of contemporary anxieties do we see in the compulsion of returning to biographical figures to retell the stories of uh, stories of the past is something that I would leave you now uh, to uh, think or think uh, along uh, with. Thank you.